Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, Josh Silverman. He's the CEO of Aromix, A-R-O-M-Y-X. And uh, we talked about his technology last time, but I wanted to get into detecting cancer by using uh, olfactory type systems. So, Josh, thanks for coming back. No, thanks for having me, Richard. I really appreciate it. Yeah, tell me why your interest in cancer, why your uh, your thoughts about working with it. Yeah, well, so I would say at a high level, the use of smell or olfaction to detect diseases is well known and has been known for hundreds of years. You can look back at um, actually ancient Greek texts and it, it talks about diagnosing disease based on the smell and recognizing when something is off with the humors or <laughs> other things. But it turns out, again, our noses are just really good chemical detectors. We're able to detect tiny differences in very complex chemical mixtures. And it turns out, you know, in, when your body is healthy, your tissues are putting out small metabolites. And when you're diseased, those, you know, whatever that diseased tissue is, changes the pattern of metabolites that it's putting out based on what's wrong with it. And that's something that our noses can pick up because it's a change in chemical signature. And we recognize it as a smell, or right? Because that's how we describe things that we detect with our nose. So even though it is a distinct chemical metabolite signature from the tissue, we describe it as yeasty or sweet or, or putrid or something, you know, what, depending on what's going on with that tissue. And again, doctors have known for again, hundreds of years, you can smell diabetes on people's breath. You can smell lung cancer on people's breath. Um, you can smell uh, Parkinson's disease uh, based on you know, sweat on the, the, the back. So it, all of these molecules are a metabolites coming off the tissues are a very, very accurate and sensitive way to detect disease. We're just, uh, it comes back to the, the premise of aromics is humans, humans are really good at smelling and detecting things. They're really bad at describing and quantifying. So, you know, if I tell you, you know, your breath smells kind of yeasty, I think you might have cancer. You know, that's a very vague <laughs> and subjective description. And it'd be really hard for a doctor to actually you know, prescribe a treatment or anything based on that. So instead of having uh, somebody tell you what they think your breath smells like, we're developing uh, assays that use those same receptors from the nose and tongue 
but put it into a format that actually could be run as a validated clinical assay that can be used to diagnose a disease state. Good question. Is it our cells and the metabolites that they're producing that you know change when we're sick, or is it our microbiome's metabolites? Uh, it, it's a good question. In, in some cases, it can be both. And this is, again, why the olfactory system is great, because what we're doing is we're detecting the pattern of small molecules that's coming off the body, and we're detecting what's different about it. And so whether that change comes from the microbiome or the tissues, in some sense, it doesn't matter. As long as there is a characteristic diagnostic signature that we can recognize, then, then we'll pick that up. Oh, but are you able to trace it back or is there any need to trace it back to who, what cellular entity is creating it? At the moment, I, certainly we can trace it back. I don't, at the moment, I don't see a, a definitive need as long as we can show that, you know, we can accurately diagnose that the, the disease is there. Um, certainly it would be nice to know where it was coming from, but in terms of, you know, demonstrating accuracy and validating the test, it's not a necessary component. What about the um, the pathways that created the substance that, you know, if someone has uh, cancer and their breath smells yep. yeasty, what's what's being created and what does that tell you? What pathways are upregulated? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a really good question because then that leads to once you can, if you can figure out what are the types of compounds that are causing that smell that are out of alignment, that might give you insight back to the underlying cause of the disease. So um, you know, what are the types of molecules that are being produced, which tell you what were the metabolic problems that are happening in the tissue of interest. And that might, in some cases, give you a target for a disease, for a actual drug therapeutic target. So that's not really what we're working on at the moment. We're, we're just looking at the diagnostic part of it, but certainly, you know, the more information you get on what's actually going on in the body, uh, certainly the more helpful that'll be. So what are you able to detect, you know, what, and what, what instrument do you use to detect what's going on with someone? Yeah, so we use our proprietary system, which is based on the biological receptors from the nose and tongue, right? So we're we're using the exact same receptors that you and I both use when we're drinking coffee, you know, smelling bacon, whatever it is that we're dealing with. So we clone those, we put those into a format that we can run in the lab and measure the actual response from those individual receptors. And that, that's exactly the same data that's going from your nose to your brain when you smell something. Um, and so that, that's our system because the biological receptors literally are the most sensitive chemical detectors on the whole planet, you know, orders of magnitude better than um, any electronic sensor that we have invented ourselves. And in terms of what we can detect, so we specifically have worked on uh, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and malaria as uh, initial applications, you know, but there's a whole host of other disease states that um, we know humans can smell from the literature. And we also know that dogs can smell from the literature. And any of those we think are fair game for us to go after. Well, how far along are you in detecting or in a I guess detection is where you're going. How far along are you in detecting these things? Yeah, so I mean, our our furthest along project is in prostate cancer, and it's a, it's a really good example. So we're working in partnership with a scientist at MIT and Johns Hopkins. Uh, so Johns Hopkins is collecting urine samples from prostate cancer patients and matched controls. MIT has been studying this for a while using dogs as uh, detection agents, and she showed that you can detect differences in urine between prostate cancer patients and healthy controls. And they can show that they have, the dogs have a 95% plus sensitivity and accuracy. And we compare that to state of the art for prostate cancer detection, which is a PSA, a prostate specific antigen test, which is an FDA approved test that has an accuracy of about 60 to 65%. So that, and you know, that's a test that's used in the doctor's office, you know, all around the country every day. And we know that scent is significantly more accurate um, and non-invasive. So the PSA test is done on blood, whereas the smell test is being done on urine. So it's significantly easier to collect the urine than blood, right? And again, far more accurate. So we've done side by, essentially side-by-side -side tests on the urine samples that the dogs are testing. And we see very similar accuracy uh, and sensitivity uh, compared to the dogs. So I would say we haven't done quite enough tests to give you really strong statistics around that, but all indications are, yeah, we are in the 90 plus percent range of, of accuracy and specificity. Well, what, what's required so that your test can be done where it's non-invasive and it doesn't have to be correlated with a biopsy, where it always will. Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So for most of these sort of first line diagnostic tests, they're, they're usually correlated with a biopsy after the fact. Um, so even like the PSA test, it just recommends you for further screening. And again, the, the 60% accuracy is you know, the, the, enough for them. So you still have a bunch of uh, false positives, false negative, well, well, false positive certainly, which leads to a lot of excess biopsies. So here we would expect that uh, at least for any kind of short term, you would still want to do a biopsy afterwards if you got a positive, but the likelihood of a false positive where you're getting a biopsy for no reason, um, you know, we would expect that to be much, much lower. So you would, I think everyone would still want to confirm it as, as the next step in the normal cycle of treatment. But the ability to non-invasively screen a lot more people faster, easier, right? the more people you get into this early screening, the more of these cancers you can pick up at an early stage and the better the prognosis should be. Um, right? So just think about you know, everyone who wants a test but doesn't have time and effort to deal with a blood draw, whereas you know, urine collection is really easy, where right? you just go in and pee in a cup. So you, you more people in, you get better, more accurate results. Hopefully that would be a, a win for everybody. So which uh, diagnostic tests are you closest to rolling out there? Like what do you have to do? What kind of trials you need to do to, in order to get it working? Yeah, yeah. So a trial, so th this is a little bit different than the rest of our business because it is an FDA regulated area. So yeah, we would need to do larger, broader clinical trials. I and mean, we have the partners in place to do that. Uh, we, and you know, these basically it, it's following a very well-established protocol for any other diagnostic test because we are using a biochemical assay. We can validate it just like any other lab test, uh, you would get when you send your, your, you know, you go to the doctor today, you pee in a cup, you send it off to a lab. They run a series of tests on it, depending on what the doctor ordered. You know, we could do, we could fit right into that system and the, the validation and regulatory path for those other tests that are being run on the urine, it was exactly the same type of validation uh, that we would run on our test. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's fundamentally not significantly different sort of how we operate and, uh, and run this test, right? And you know, compare that to say the dogs, all right? And, and I, this is, we're actually um, about to write an article uh, about this exact same thing, right? So again, the idea that humans can smell disease has been known for hundreds of years. The idea that dogs can smell disease has been known for hundreds of years. And, and again, you have these studies published by MIT and Johns Hopkins around you know, 98, 99% sensitivity and accuracy being able to detect cancers with dogs. And yet there are no approved scent diagnostics today, right? And the core of the problem is that scent as done by humans and dogs doesn't scale, right? So when you think about how do you validate, like I can get this one dog, I can, I can train it, I can validate that this dog works. How do I tell, prove to the FDA that the next 10 dogs that I train are going to have exactly the same results? Because every dog is different. How do I, you know, the next 10 technicians that I train to do this, how do I know they're going to have this? And the answer is that you can't because there's way too much variability and subjectivity in that. Uh, so again, for us, it's a very clear, simple path for uh, validation, just like any other lab diagnostics. And that we think overcomes the, the major limitation that's been present in the field where, again, we know that scent is great for diagnostics, just the tools haven't been there to turn it into something that is scalable to run on thousands of people, thousands of samples per day, which is where you need to get to for you know prostate cancer, just pancreatic cancer. Well, what does it look like if you run the test? Do you... Uh... You just hold up an instrument near their nose and they breathe on it or they sneeze on it or how do you get the info? Yeah. So, I mean, the way we would do it is, again, a lab-based test. So where, I mean, eventually you could do breath diagnostics and things that are in the doctor's office. So that that's certainly on our roadmap. But the first version of the test doesn't need to be that complicated, right? So, so again, we're thinking, you know, detection in urine. And urine is a really, it, it turns out, I mean, that's where we've done most of our validation. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But theoretically, urine is a really great substrate. One, it's easy to collect. It's very non-invasive to collect. And two, it really is a um, aggregation of all the small molecules from the body. Like the whole purpose of the kidneys is to filter out small molecules from the bloodstream, the waste products from all the tissues in the body. So urine is essentially a collection of all of the volatile small molecules from every tissue in your body all the time. And so again, if you're trying to use, and, and those volatile chemicals, small molecules are exactly what are causing the scent profile. That's what you smell when you're smelling sweat or the breath or anything else. So anything that comes from the bloodstream, from the tissues is going to end up in the urine. So it's a great catch-all validated or, or sample that we can validate across a number of diseases. And so what well, we do- will, will, it, will it show up in the urine or does some stuff only show up in the breath? And maybe it's well, easier to figure out in the breath for a certain condition versus urine. So far, so I would say there haven't been a lot of side-by-side -side studies, so I, I can't give you a definitive answer. But so far, every time it's been looked, uh, where people have, have looked for it, it shows up in both places. So again, you think about if it's showing up in the breath, that means it's being exhaled from the lungs, which means it's basically volatilizing from the blood because the blood is doing the gas exchange from you know, carbon dioxide and oxygen crossing it. So if you're exhaling it, it actually came from the blood, which means the kidneys were also doing a pretty good job at filtering it too, right? As long as it's a small molecule, and if it's small enough that you can actually volatilize it in your breath, it'll be filtered out by the kidneys as well. So I think, again, good logical reasons why if it's in the breath, it should also be in the, in the urine. Yeah, I just wonder if um, the chemicals that are found in the breath may be easier to analyze in the urine or vice versa. I mean, and for some indications, it may be. And we do have, I would say, more anecdotal data descriptions from doctors where they could smell diseases on people's breath. But to be fair, it, you know, it's much more likely that doctors are going to be smelling patients' breath than smelling their urine, right? So I don't, I don't think there's going to, you know, the, the fact that we don't have a whole lot of descriptions from doctors around what did the urine smell like, I don't think that's a, should be viewed as a negative in this case. So again, where we've looked, it's the same. And I think logically you can make an argument why it should be the same. And, and again, having one standardized method of, of collection and testing makes our lives a lot easier for a platform type of diagnostic. And so when we, we think about it, again, you, lab testing on urine samples, very well established. You go into the doctor, you pee in a cup, they have all of the sample handling in place, um, labeling in place, send it to a test, uh, you know, a central testing facility, apply it in a biochemical assay, get the readout of, you know, which olfactory receptors are turning on or not based on the, the concentration of urine added to the, um, the test. And that gives you a yes, no answer of, you know, you're likely to be you know, likely to have this disease that we're testing for or likely not, right? So that doesn't require any, any you know, new type of method, new validation, new modality that the FDA would have a lot of questions around. We're slotting it right into an existing pathway, existing framework, and we think that's going to make our lives a lot easier. And how do we get to the market fast and, and start benefiting patients as quickly as possible? Yeah, the reason why I kept harping on it is, you know, urine is still a little bit invasive, you know, go and pee in this cup. Um, with breath, you could watch someone do the test in case you were worried about not getting the right results. And again, they wouldn't have to have drank water and have to go to the bathroom. Um, yeah. So in certain circumstances, maybe it's easier and less invasive. I don't know. Yeah, no, no. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There are certainly situations where breath would be easier. And it comes back to it, when we're just entering, you know, we're getting our first product in, we're, we're just uh, we want to take the, the path of least resistance, as it were, right? I mean, the, the thing that the FDA is most comfortable seeing, the sample collection that everyone's most comfortable with, we're not inventing new devices. We're not inventing new modalities. I mean, there, there's there's whole, you think it's simple to blow into a, a tube, right? I mean, I've seen um, trials where they've tried to control that. And, you know, people will breathe at different, you know, people with different lung capacities breathe at different volumes. How do you control that? What did they when you say urine, how much water did they drink? But breath, you know, what if they had a, a piece of gum, you know, an hour before? Or what if they had, um, you know, a lot of garlic for dinner the night before? Right? You still have a whole lot of variables you need to control. It doesn't, it doesn't completely get rid of those. So I, I'm with you. Yes, it would be great. Um, and again, long term, I would see that that's absolutely a possibility. 
but in terms of short-term path to market, we're just trying to eliminate as many variables as possible, right? We only want we only want to have to prove one miracle. We don't want to have to do four or five miracles. Yeah, I just think it as trade-offs, but I guess there's more trade-offs than I thought between breath and urine. But what, what about uh, sweat? Or again, it's, it's just easier to do urine, like a well, skin swab. Yeah, there's sweat. Uh, saliva is another one that, that comes up a lot, and which are relative. Saliva is certainly going to be a lot easier to collect than, than sweat. In sweat, you get a lot of, you'd have to do some kind of a, a swab and then trying to normalize the amounts of sweat on a swab. I'm not quite sure. There's a whole lot of questions you have to figure out on how to do that. You know, saliva, you could do it by volume and collect it fairly easily. So that, that's something we've looked at as well. Again, we part of the reason I like urine from a theoretical standpoint is, again, the kidneys are literally designed to collect small molecules from every tissue in the body. So if you do want sort of the most flexible, the most sensitive, the, you know, the most inclusive test with a single input, again, urine theoretically makes a lot of sense. What condition do you think will be the first one that you guys will have a test available for? Yeah, well, like I said, uh, prostate cancer is, is probably our most well-advanced and we're really interested in, in pushing that forward. We have, um, again, good partners, both on the academic and the, the foundation and funding side. And we're really excited about the pancreatic cancer approach as well. So uh, prostate cancer, right, there's a test on the market that's 60% accurate. So we, can, we think we can do a lot better than that, but there is at least a test on the market. Pancreatic cancer, there is nothing. There is no validated uh, test at all. And people are only diagnosed with pancreatic cancer once the doctors have eliminated every other possible thing that could be there, right? And then they sort of default to the pancreatic cancer as the last, okay, now this is what you probably have. And the problem is then, you know, for the doctors to go through and eliminate all of these other steps, pancreatic cancer gets diagnosed very, very late in the cycle. And it's one of the deadliest cancers out there. So in terms of where could we have an impact much sooner or, well, that's not right, but where we can have an impact much greater to the patient, you know, that, you know, pancreatic cancer, I'm very excited about, because if, if this does become a sensitive and accurate early stage diagnostic, that is a big unmet need for pancreatic cancer today. And there have been some preliminary studies uh, from Imperial College in London showing that they can detect differences in exhaled breath, again, in this case, with pancreatic cancer versus uh, healthy controls. So again, good indications that we should be able to do this. What if you were to uh, do breath and blood and urine and sweat or just some combination of two or three different type tests, would that be confirmatory enough and would that raise the, uh, or would that lower the false positive and false negative rate? Would it make it more accurate? I would assume it should make it more accurate, right? In theory, the more data you have, the more accurate it should be. Um, so, so absolutely. It's a question of diminishing returns, right? Every, every single new modality or, or you know, material that you're collecting needs a essentially a completely new assay validation just in the way that FDA rules work. So you would have to revalidate the assay to that, okay, it, it works in saliva and is as sensitive in urine, right? So it's essentially doubling the amount of work for every sample that you're adding, for every type of sample you're adding. And so the question is then how much more accurate, you know, you're doubling your workload, how much more accuracy is that giving you? Um, and if you're already 90% accurate, right, there's not a whole lot more accurate you can get. So that's something we'll certainly look at. I, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I would say, you know, historically, that's not something that people generally do. Like when you get your, you get a blood test, you know, you just get one blood test and they, they run it once. So, you know, there, there may be some exceptions here and there, but. Uh, At what point do you, how long do you think you'll be ready? Or how long do you think it'll take to be ready to have a test for pancreatic cancer or other conditions? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, diagnostics are a faster path to approval than a therapeutic, but it's still not something that happens overnight. Right? So, so the, the regulatory process with the FDA, it's, it's more than a year. Uh, I don't want to quote you a specific number, but it's, it's reasonable. And we're not at the part place where we're ready to start that process yet. So I would say we're, we're at least two years out, maybe closer to three or four. Um, and we're looking at, you know, different business models and funding opportunities to looking for partners to help us uh, push this forward. Um, but yeah, lots of interest, especially in, in areas where you know, there's strong unmet need and then for, you know, real accurate diagnosis. Yeah, what, um, 
is there a particular condition that you would really love to be able to uh, to diagnose? Is it pancreatic cancer or is it something else? Well, yeah, right now, yeah, pancreatic cancer is absolutely high on my list again because there again there is no way to do it earlier, and we it is literally one of the most deadly cancers right now. So again, there's absolutely strong on that need there. The other one we are spending a little bit of time on is thinking about a platform for uh, infectious disease. And obviously with COVID, this is sort of top of everybody's mind. And I'm not very excited about a COVID diagnostic because basically by the time we would get something approved, I hope that COVID is enough under control that our diagnostic wouldn't be that useful. But when we think about a platform to assess early stage infectious disease like COVID. So the problem is when you get COVID, you get influenza, you get Ebola, the first symptoms are identical, right? Cough and a fever. And, you know, you start, you come down with a, you can say, I have a fever and it, that could be pretty much any virus <laughs> in the planet, right? And so, and knowing what you have earlier can help to improve treatment options and get you into the doctor sooner rather than later. Uh, and get you the right treatment sooner rather than later, which always leads, well, most of the time leads to better outcomes. So that type of a platform, if we can start differentiating those infectious diseases early enough, then, and again, be able to tell you if you have influenza or Ebola, for example, that type of a, a diagnostic test could be incredibly useful just throughout the developing world um, and, uh, and even in, in our country as well. Well, very good. What's the best way for people to find out more about uh, aromics? Where can they go? Yeah, they can go to our website, uh, www.aromics.com, so easy enough. Or certainly I'd be happy for people to email me directly at josh at aromics.com. Very good. Well, thanks for coming back again, and uh, it's great work you're doing. I really appreciate it. No, thanks, Richard. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me as well. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.